morning, everybody. My name is Jens Chapman, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Orthopedic Grand Rounds. Today's topic is a pretty small bone, and some say a very negligible bone. But uh, whenever you look at the Tour de France, several no uh, very noteworthy riders have to discontinue because they break this particular bone. It's a clavicle, or the collarbone I'm talking of, about. And uh, this is a bone that some people can say you can resect, and others uh, spend a lot of time trying to fix. Uh, a lot of people claim that you don't even have to treat it at all, that it'll just heal fine. Um, here I'm going to invite Brett Wider and uh, Steve Benershka and uh, uh, our dear friend Winston Warm to discuss the various treatment options as to when we'll do something and how we best uh, treat it. So, Brett, take the lead, please. Good morning. Thanks for showing up and tuning in to hear our talk about controversies in mid-shaft clavicle fracture care. In a classic paper in 1960, Neer wrote, the clavicle as a bone is a nonconformist. What I think he meant by that is that the clavicle doesn't seem to follow the same rules that other bones do. It's the first bone to ossify, but it's the last to fuse. It's also the only bone to form by intramembranous ossification. It accounts for 5% of all fractures, uh, but despite this propensity for fracture, it generally heals pretty well with minimal intervention. For thousands of years, clavicle fractures have been treated non-operatively. And there's even some evidence that the ancient Egyptians treated them with primitive fi figure of eight braces. Hippocrates, the father of medicine himself, advocated benign neglect. Today, however, treatment is much more controversial. So in the lecture, we'll discuss the anatomy of the clavicle, mechanism of injury, clinical and radiographic evaluation, fracture classification, management options including non-operative uh, surgical indications, and then I'll turn the mic over to Dr. Benershka to talk about ORIF with plate fixation, and Dr. Warren will follow with intramedullary fixation. We'll conclude the grand rounds with some case presentations. The clavicle is an S-shaped bone with a convex anterior border medially and a concave uh, anterior border laterally. It's cylindrical medially with a thick cortex, and it flattens out as you move more laterally and has a very thin cortex. It functions as a strut and it connects the axial to the appendicular skeleton of the upper extremity. It provides protection to the brachial plexus and the subclavian vessels. The muscular attachments include the uh, sternocleidomastoid, which inserts superiorly and medially. The pectoralis major inserts anteromedially. The deltoid inserts anterolaterally. And the trapezius inserts posteriorly. The subclavius inserts inferiorly. In maximum abduction of the arm, the clavicle itself elevates 15 degrees. It retracts 30 degrees and rotates along its uh, posterior, uh, it rotates posterior along its longitudinal axis 30 degrees. Uh, by far and away, the most common mechanism of injury is a fall or a blow to the point of the shoulder, uh, causing axial compression of the clavicle. Less commonly, it's the result of a direct blow, such as with a seatbelt or a hockey stick. And even less commonly, it's a fragility-type fracture after a fall onto an outstretched hand. Uh, but of course, you also have the high-energy mechanisms. And I, I had to and include a motivational poster here. And this defines vigilance as always using protective gear when doing stunts, i.e. sunglasses and, and bandana. <laughs> it's an injury of young people with the highest incidence in young males less than uh, 20 years old. On clinical evaluation, you'll find that the patient holds the arm in adduction and is splinted by the contralateral extremity. The proximal fragment is prominent and it tends the skin. It's best evaluated radiographically with standard AP films and a cephalad tilt view. And it's always critical to perform a thorough neurologic exam given the close proximity to the subclavian vessels and the brachial plexus. The deforming forces in a mid-diaphyseal clavicle fracture are the upward pull of the sternocleidomastoid on the medial fragment, the weight of the arm pulls the lateral fragment inferiorly, and the fracture is shortened by the pull of the pectoralis and the latissimus. There are multiple classification schemes, perhaps the most well-known is the ulman, which breaks it down into mid, distal, and proximal thirds. Then you have the OTA, in which the clavicle is assigned the number 6, 6A simple, B wedge, C complex. Uh, but with the most descriptive and the most relevant to our talk today is the Edinburgh classification, which is similar to the Allman in that it breaks it down into 
uh, medial, midshaft, and distal, but it also subclassifies each type. So for the type 2 midshafts, you have A1, which is a non-displaced fracture, A2 is angulated, B1 is a simple wedge comminution, i.e. butterfly fragment, and then B2 is the complex and segmental comminution. As I stated earlier, the mainstay treatment for years has been non-operative, and there's in fact over 200 different forms of immobilization that have been described over the years. The most frequently cited paper dealing with the treatment of clavicle fractures was written by Dr. Charles Neer and published in JAMA in 1960. He reviewed uh, 2,235 fractures that presented to New York Presbyterian between 1936 and 1959. Out of all those fractures, there were only 18 non-unions, and he observed that these non-unions were symptomatic, and there was increased rate of non-union with ORIF, and he concluded that ORIF was necessary only in select cases. The criticism of the study is that pediatric fractures were included. A study by Rowe published eight years later had similar results. He studied 565 fractures, and his non-union rate was less than 1% in the non-op group, almost 4% in the ORIF group, and his recommendations were non-operative treatment in a spica cast or a wide figure of eight wrap. Needless to say, we no longer treat clavicle fractures in spica casts. However, until recently, it was unclear whether a figure of eight brace or, uh, was superior to a simple sling. A study by Anderson et al. In, published in 1987 shed some light on this. It was a prospective randomized controlled trial that showed that there was identical function and cosmetic results with figure of eight versus sling. The sling had less discomfort and fewer complications, and there was absolutely no difference in radiographic outcome. In fact, in both groups, the final radiographic outcome was unchanged relative to the initial displacement. So how do we treat clavicles non-operatively today? We immobilize them for two to six weeks in a figure of eight or a sling. We allow the patient to return to light activity in four to six weeks and heavy activity in six to eight weeks. And it's important to remember that there's no way to reduce and hold fractures and that displaced fractures heals male unions. So what is the real risk of a non-union? Up until recently, we thought it was less than 1%. But recent literature suggests that this rate is actually much higher. One such study was published in 04 by Robinson in the Edinburgh group in which they reviewed 868 clavicles treated non-operatively. They found a non-union rate of 4.5%. There was an increased risk of non-union with fracture displacement, female gender, comminution, and advanced patient age. They also came up with what's called a prognostic index, which will determine the risk of non-union. The lower curve is uh, the risk of non-union at 24 weeks in the hatch curve is risk of non-union at 12 weeks. So for example, a 66-year-old female with a displaced comminuted diaphyseal fracture has a prognostic index of minus 2. Her risk of non-union at 12 weeks is 0.8% and at 24 weeks is around 40%. On the other hand, a 22-year-old male with a displaced non-comminuted fracture has a prognostic index of minus 1. Uh, his risk of non-union at 12 weeks is 50% and less than 10% at 24 weeks. A year later, a nice study was published in JOT in which the evidence-based orthopedic trauma group meta-analyzed uh, over 2,000 non-operatively treated clavicle fractures in the literature. The rate of non-union for a mid-shaft fracture overall was 6%, and that rate jumped up to 15% for displaced fractures. Uh, they've concluded, and that the risk of non-union in long-term sequelae was increased with fracture displacement, comminution, and advanced patient age. They also found that the sling was better than a figure of eight wrap. So how did these patients do clinically? We know from Nier's work that non-unions are symptomatic, but what about the male unions? The first study to use patient-based outcome measures was published by Hill et al. in JBJS British in 1997. They looked at uh, 242 displaced mid-diaphyseal fractures and found a 15% rate of non-union, which were universally painful. Overall, the quarter of the patients present, uh, had residual pain, 37% had decreased tolerance for overhead activity, 29% had persistent brachial plexus irritation, 
and around half had cosmetic complaints. They concluded that initial shortening greater than two centimeters increased the risk of non-union and unsatisfactory outcome. In 06, McKee and the Toronto group used some more objective patient-based outcome measures and found that when they compared non-operatively treated diaphyseal fractures to the uninjured side, they found that motion was overall well-maintained, but strength was decreased. This decrease in strength was uh, greatest in abduction endurance, which was only 67% the strength of the uninjured side. This decrease in abduction endurance was inversely proportional to the amount of shortening. They also found that there was significant disability on mean constant and DASH scores. This set the stage for the landmark study published a year later in which 132 patients were randomized uh, to either a sling or a plate. They uh, found that their constant and uh, DASH scores were improved with ORIF at all time points at 6, 12, 24, and 52 weeks and that the time to union for ORIF was uh, 16 weeks versus 28 weeks in the sling. Overall, there's a higher, higher patient satisfaction with ORIF. A cadaveric study out of Japan published this year looked at the scapular kinematics with clavicular shortening and found that when the clavicle was shortened by 10%, there was a significant change in the scapula, which resulted in decreased posterior tilt and decreased external rotation. So in summary, non-displaced fractures are best treated in a, in a sling. <coughs> Rate of non-union in displaced fractures is around 15%, and these are pretty much all symptomatic. The rate of malunion in displaced fractures is around 100%, and these can have significant patient morbidity. Indications for surgery are displaced fractures with shortening, skin compromise or open fractures, neurovascular injury, floating shoulder with a displaced fracture, relative contraindications, infection, prior irradiation, overlying burns, debilitating medical conditions, poor compliance, and a sedentary lifestyle. Nowadays, we have a lot of different tools uh, to get our uh, reduction and hold uh, our fracture from uh, displacement to allow it to heal. We have multiple different kinds of plates, DCPs, recons, pre-contour locking plates. And there's also a bunch of different kinds of uh, IM uh, fixation, nose pins, rockwood screws, and flexible nails. So now I'll turn the mic over to Dr. Benershka to talk about plate fixation. Thanks, Brett. That was actually a really wonderful uh, introduction to this topic, which I think is uh, becoming of more interest in the last, uh, I would say, five to ten years. So we're going to talk briefly about the management of clavicle fractures with uh, plate fixation. I really can't do justice to this topic without really giving uh, credit to the co-workers I have with me at Harborview who all treat these on a regular basis. My partners actually routinely are addressing these injuries, and I believe that really without their input, this topic is really uh, underserved, so I really have to give them credit. Uh, as Brett indicated, historically, uh, as in, when I was in training, most of these were all treated uh, in conservative means, and essentially what happened was we thought they were successfully treated by virtue of their healing. The problem was that these were all healing with a 100% malunion rate, and the issues were what that affected uh, their ultimate function. Essentially, the, the interest or the uh, intensity by which these were addressed by trauma centers was really advocated by this paper in 2005, which illustrated that perhaps we should look more closely at operatively treated fractures with respect to the return of function, and that was already illustrated by Brett. So we're going to talk briefly about the indications for plate fixation, the rationale, uh, the plate type, and then lastly, plate location, and at the end, we're going to have some cases to sort of illustrate this. Probably the rationale is best illustrated in this slide, which shows that uh, the restoration of the morphology of the clavicle really is the critical thing in respect to rest restoration of length because it provides the anterior strut or suspension for the shoulder. Uh, essentially, the glenohumeral joint can be loaded more appropriately. And by virtue of this axial load, if you have the anterior strut intact of the clavicle, it provides the control of the shoulder and restoration of this uh, tripod. Cosmetically, the fracture or the displacement of the injury characteristically gives you a local uh, deformity that you can see here, which is, was illustrated by Brett as well, where you see this proximal migration of the 
medial fragment, and this essentially does not resolve. Essentially, uh, it also accompanies a foreshortening of the shoulder girdle, which you can see on the, the AP view, especially on the bottom right of this patient's shoulder by virtue of the shortening. It also has a global determination in terms of how the shoulder girdle then presents because with significant shortening, which I've shown with this outline of the clavicular fragments overlapped, what happens to the rest of the shoulder is also affected. And this is really well shown in this AP chest X-ray, which shows not only that foreshortening that you can see, but also a change in the scapular thoracic orientation with respect to the contralateral side. Uh, this is really well illustrated by a superior view of the clavicle showing where the shortening occurs, and you see this where that restoration of length essentially affects that strut phenomenon that we talked about earlier. That same patient, when you look at them from the front, you can see the bump that you characteristically look at, and that's what the patient uh, is visible when you look at the frontal plane. But when you look from the back, you see the characteristic lack of the strut support of the front and this characteristic scapular winging, which is due to this anterior foreshortening of the clavicle, which essentially changes those mechanics. The key to success in this treatment uh, with plate fixation is really in some way, shape, or form providing compression across the fracture surfaces. Uh, this is essentially by providing what we call absolute stability or rigid fixation that allows primary bone healing with a minimal amount of callus, which can sometimes be detrimental to neurologic function. We've learned from the AO group that over-aggressive dissection in many other bones, including the clavicle, is fraught with complications, and that's probably why many of the more rigid plates were originally used. The idea of doing a more uh, classic uh, uh, tissue sparing procedure would be more advocated in terms of managing, especially this injury. This is really well illustrated in a series of works and probably came to the US in 1970 with the, the uh, work on the right, the Manual of Internal Fixation, which actually was initially presented in the US in 1970. So we're gonna talk about implants. Essentially what I think you should really think of as these implants should be tailored to the injury. The goal is rigid fixation and fracture compression. If you look at the three implants that we're currently using, uh, the reconstruction plates are the workhorse group, uh, the 27 or 35 reconstruction plate. Then there's the DCP, which has been supplanted by the LCDCP, and more recently the locking plates, which are really primarily for significant osteopenia, marked avascularity, or uh, in the presence of severe comminution. So you have to realize that the 2.7 and 3.5 millimeter reconstruction plates, which are wonderful plates to use, are essentially made uh, accessible to us as surgeons by being heat annealed by the companies that make them. This allows them to be contoured precisely in multiple planes, but unfortunately that does create some weakening and it's very important that these are really anchored with lag screw fixation to the implant, so the implant alone cannot hold this together. The DCPs, as uh, you can imagine, are much stiffer. They can't be contoured very easily in the sagittal plane. They can be bent through screw holes. Uh, they are essentially advocated for markedly accommodated injuries. There have been uh, a rash of companies now coming out with pre-contoured implants. Uh, the question is their utility. They are basically allowed to be placed superiorly, anteriorly, uh, have locking components. And the question is really, do we um, routinely use these with respect to their costs and perhaps their versatility? Uh, Jerry Wong, who's a, a, a faculty member here, actually wrote a very nice article in JBGS demonstrating, looking at a series of cadavers, how variable the clavicle is in all planes. On the left, you see the significant variety of the S-shaped curve of the clavicle, and therefore, it would be very difficult to have one plate fit all of those shapes. And then when you look from the frontal plane, you see the superior surface also changes dramatically with respect to the various clavicle shapes. So really, uh, when you take a pre-contoured plate, try to contour that to this complex shape. It's sometimes difficult to contour because these are very stiff. They're also very bulky. And if you look closely, the whole configuration does not allow you to dynamically load these fractures or compress them. So plate location is really injury specific. It should be tailored to the fracture pathoanatomy uh, and perhaps the patient's specific needs. For example, if you know that they're gonna be using a backpack, perhaps you'd consider a different location for the implant. But it's really never a cookbook kind of phenomenon. Talking about superior plating, the advantages are that it's a subcutaneous approach. The, almost always you can put a lag screw through the plate. Contouring is more intuitive because you're looking directly down on this S-shaped curve and therefore you can more accurately, precisely uh, contour the implant. 
The disadvantage is they are prominent, especially uh, the, more, the thicker implants, and you are drilling toward the great vessels, and I think the critical thing is to be very cognizant of that when you're doing this procedure. The uh, subclavian structures that you can see are in close proximity to the clavicle. You can see the subclavian artery and vein in the plexus, and in the middle third, those are uh, right under the clavicle, and therefore plunging with a drill would not be advisable. The anterior inferior plate became more popular in the last 10 years, largely because it's ideal for the lateral third, but we've applied this to other injuries as well. It is less prominent. Uh, it's ideal for um, the DCP because it can be contoured through the plate holes to accommodate that S-shaped curve from the front. The disadvantages are that it is a soft tissue stripping procedure with respect to the deltoid anteriorly, and you have to recognize that may change your rehab protocol afterwards. And if you look, this slide showing the way the anterior deltoid wraps around the front of the clavicle on the lateral side, how that would have to be taken down to put an anterior plate on. Here's a, a well-known patient of ours who, as a bicyclist, went over his handlebars, uh, landed on his helmet, uh, cracked his helmet, and had an ipsilateral scapular injury, which was relatively accommodated, as well as a scapular body fracture and a hemoneumothorax. And he was exquisitely uncomfortable in any attempt to move him because of the multiplicity of his injuries. And essentially when he had his surgical procedure done, we essentially tailored the fixation. And as you can see it really, this is a plate that begins anteriorly and ends superiorly because this is the best advocated for his particular fracture pathoanatomy and allowing us to put a lag screw through the plate. Here's another example for a motocross accident in a severely traumatized patient with clavicular injury, humerus, open olecranon, distal humerus fracture as well as scapulothoracic dissociation on the left side. The right side had just a clavicle and a glenoid injury, and the patient had all of his upper extremity injuries managed, including the clavicle. The right side was not treated. He comes back to clinic two weeks later begging for fixation of his right clavicle because that's the one extremity he could not use well because of the instability that was still present. Complications are essentially uh, shown in this article, really showing that this is not a benign procedure. You really have to approach this with some trepidation and really uh, understanding the pathoanatomy and how to address this appropriately. You can see that 103 patients, 24 patients had complications, which is really quite high if you think about the management of many of the other bones that we deal with. Complications uh, with inadequate fixation are usually very early failures, and they are usually because there is not a uh, solid fixation construct arrived at the end of the procedure. And here you see an example where there was no lag screw used. The distal fixation immediately becomes uh, in jeopardy, and then the deformity recurs. This was uh, managed with a completely different venue, and you can see the implant is now placed from the front because all the superior fixation was uh, not solid, and this required a, a much longer implant with the anterior fixation. So briefly about operative fixation, then we'll finish. Uh, we've gone essentially away from treating these in the beach chair position to the supine position. We use an interscapular roll to allow the clavicle to become more prominent. We prep the, either the entire shoulder girdle or just the clavicle itself, depending on what we're anticipating intraoperatively. But the, the whole prep allows us to see the entire axis, and we always make sure that the C-arm will allow us good visualization on the AP and the 45 degrees cephalic tilt x-ray. The incision is usually interclavicular, and the idea is it's the intention of the scar is to not be on the weight-bearing surface of the clavicle. Uh, this incision involves mobilizing the supraclavicular nerves, which are present in every one of these, unless they're avulsed by the injury, and essentially you won't need to dissect around these, and you want to minimize the stripping. This is an artist's rendition showing the supraclavicular nerves, the medial, the intermediate, and lateral supraclavicular nerves, which are draping over. On the bottom right, you see they can be quite robust, or in this case, quite diaphanous, where you have to be very careful in their dissection so that you have to slide the plate under this, uh, these various uh, overlying structures. The goal is restoration of functional anatomy. So function follows form, malfunction follows malformation. There's really no indication for using some of these uh, thinner plates, which although they do auto contour, they're not stiff enough. And the, the third tubular plates, which have been used in the past, are essentially to be uh, not used at all because of the instability that will routinely happen. Uh, this is just an example of such an injury. Here's a, a relatively Minimally accommodated clavicular injury, you can see the initial uh, displacement. This was managed with a plate, and this is at one week. Uh, the patient uh, already has failure of one of the holes. There's also already the characteristic loosening on the lateral side. 
At two weeks, it doesn't get much better. The plate's now broken in two locations and the deformity has recurred. This needs to be managed with more rigid fixation and as we, uh, we talked about, some sort of lag screw fixation if at all possible. It's important when you do revision surgery that you absolutely get a reduction in restoration of morphology. And here you see this was revised with a straight plate on the superior surface. The fracture wasn't reduced and essentially despite maintaining the grip of the fixation, if you look at this view, you can see although the plate is still solidly on the bone, there's a persistent non-union and essentially a malalignment of the injury and chronic pain. This was managed purely by removing the implant, restoring the length of the clavicle, getting a primary fracture line where you could put a lag screw through the plate, and the ultimate fixation was a plate that was placed from the top with two lag screws through the, the in this case, non-union. This just shows from this inferior view the importance of the multiplanar shaping that's necessary for clavicular uh, superior plate placement, and it's really possible with these reconstruction plates. In, in rehabilitation, you need to have stability that allows active assisted range of motion or passive range of motion with gravity eliminated or Codman exercises and the patient needs to have the confidence to be able to do this. Uh, otherwise they can't recur, re recover the function that you'd ideally like them to have. So in summary, you have to have a good pre-op plan uh, to avoid pitfalls, a careful exposure and dissection that's predicated on the pathoanatomy of the injury, dynamically loaded fixation so that you have enough stability following the reconstruction to allow a functional aftercare so the patient can use their arm. Failures are usually the surgical method and really are not patient error. So we're going to go on now with Winston who will talk to us about intermedullary fixation. Thank you very much and good morning. That was an excellent review on the clavicle fracture management over the years and also an excellent talk on plating. We'd like to move on to intermedullary fixation. As Brett mentioned, there have been multiple different tools that have been used over time to fix clavicles, going back to K wires, which are just straight wires, and Knowles pins have uh, the ability to tighten down a little nut, uh, a modified Hagee pin, which has differential threads and also some nuts on the lateral side, the uh, more recent use of the titanium elastic nails, and Lastly, this Sonoma clavicle repair device that's just been uh, FDA approved for approximately a year. The advantages of using an intermedullary device are that you can potentially do this through a smaller incision, which can be more cosmetically appealing and possibly have less pain postoperatively. Also, the potential for a close reduction exists in that you may be able to get the uh, intermedullary device into the distal fragment without opening the fracture site and leaving a more biologically friendly environment that may facilitate healing. One of the advantages of using an intermedullary device is that it is less prominent on the clavicle and in military and paramilitary type of occupations where a lot of weight is carried on the shoulder girdle, this may in fact allow for a more comfortable use of the shoulder. Also, avocationally, many people use backpacks as they commute to work on bicycles or go up into the mountains, and they may have less problems utilizing backpacks in the future. However, these devices can allow for shortening, and when shortening occurs, uh, we're not restoring the morphology as, as Steve has talked to us about, and the pin can either move out laterally and penetrate the lateral cortex or the medial cortex. This can cause problems and require revision surgery. Also, these pins are not as robust as the plates that Steve has advocated, and therefore they can break. And sometimes they'll actually heal with exuberant callus, as you see down here. And this can actually leave the patient with a bump that can be problematic later and a cause for concern. Now over the years, K-wires have been used and less and less frequently in the shoulder as we've learned that they can cause problems. And in this particular case, the problem was the device was not strong enough and it led to a non-union. This was salvaged utilizing an elastic nail technique. And you see on the far right, uh, a very good restoration and healing.
However, K wires have been noted to migrate from clavicles fairly significant distances. In this case, the K wire made it into the thoracic cavity and into the trachea. And you'll note some of the reports are quite recent within this decade. Another case here, a K wire used to secure an acromioclavicular joint separation that ended up in the trachea. Another one that was used in a clavicle repair that ended up in the trachea and in the innominate artery. This final case is very serious in that this particular K wire was used in a shoulder fracture repair and over time migrated all the way into the heart. And this was a fatal complication. So these cases serve as grim reminders that we need to be very cautious utilizing smooth devices in and around the shoulder. Uh, you may think that a threaded device is safer and that a threaded device can't move. This is not, in fact, true. This is an example of a shant's pin that migrated from an acromioclavicular joint into the body of C7 vertebrae. And this is a close-up uh, showing that pin and the 3D reconstruction CT scan. So, these intramedullary devices are not without complications. Uh, brachial plexus injuries have also been seen utilizing this device. And in Dr. Ring's paper in 2005, three of 20 cases had brachial plexus injuries. Thankfully, these were transient palsies that recovered. Dr. Frigg had one in, out of 34 cases that were treated with a titanium elastic nail. And this uh, was purportedly due to the manipulation of the fracture fragments. So that gives us cause to be very careful in managing these fragments, even utilizing this technique. Hagee pins have been talked about as a form of intramedullary fixation. However, they have been noted to penetrate the skin and cause skin problems and therefore require revision surgeries. And in this review of 16 cases, three found their way out of the skin posteriorly, two broke, and uh, these needed to be revised. However, all the clavicles in this series did heal. This is a case of a young 16-year-old soccer player that we managed at the University of Washington who had this displaced fracture. We treated with a modified Hagee pin or the Rockwood clavicle pin as it's called. He had very quick decrease in his pain and re returned to activity quite quickly. However, at about eight weeks, he had some irritation of the skin posteriorly and had formed a bursa. Thankfully, his fracture had already healed and we were able to remove the device and he went on to uneventful return to sport. In a review of a randomized clinical trial, Dr. Smeckel showed that intramedullary nailing actually performs superiorly to just treating these patients in a sling. All the fractures, uh, 30 in this group, united. And in the non-operative group, there were three non-unions, as you see, and two malunions, all of which required surgery. The time to union was faster in the group that received the nail, and the constant scores and DASH scores were improved in this operative group at all time points up until two years. However, in that operative group, there were uh, several complications, including medial penetration of the nail in seven cases that needed to be revised, and uh, two cases of nail breakage. So uh, nailing these fractures is not without its problems. I think some summary statements in regards to the use of intramedullary devices is should we use a smooth implant, those should be removed at some point to prevent migration to parts unknown. We'd also like to avoid excessive traction on the fracture fragments to prevent any injury to the brachial plexus and to be sure to choose an implant that's suitable for the fracture that you're operating on. We don't want to leave the operating room until the fracture is stable enough for full passive range of motion postoperatively. And to move the arm through some active assisted forward elevation a couple times a day is probably enough to preclude 
frozen shoulder or post-traumatic stiff shoulder, I've had to manage several patients who are treated non-operatively for clavicle fractures to develop intractable stiffness in the shoulder that has required arthroscopic capsulotomy. So we need to get these patients moving. We tell patients that easy activities of daily living are okay, but they shouldn't lift anything much heavier than a coffee cup for six weeks. They have to allow the fracture time to heal. Patients should understand that clavicle fractures are not necessarily going to heal properly without an intervention. And that subsequent healing is required to allow for optimal subsequent function. So the strut needs to be restored to its proper length. Patients should think about coming and talking to a knowledgeable surgeon should they have a clavicle fracture or should a member of their family have one such that they can discuss how to get an optimum outcome. We say the surgeon is the method because it really comes down to what we do in surgery. We have to look and study the fractures carefully. In this case of clavicle fractures, the bone is fairly easy to get to. However, it's not always easy to get a good outcome. Not every fracture can be managed utilizing the same device. We need to take into consideration the patient factors and the patient's aspirations, as well as the fracture morphology, and be very thoughtful. Thank you. So we'll now do some case presentations. Um, I think we can open the floor to some questions at the conclusion of each case presentation. The, this first case is courtesy of Dr. Jim Krieg, and I'll present this to Dr. Warm. This was a 12-year-old boy who was polytraumatized after he was hit by a car. You can see he has a displaced mid diaphyseal clavicle fracture. He also has a contralateral femur fracture. I think this points out the fact that even young people can get clavicle fractures that may not go on to heal uneventfully. And in this case, we see no bony apposition, and therefore, this young man is at risk of developing a non-union because it's very likely that there's muscle or soft tissue in between these fracture fragments. What we also see is that the fracture is not particularly comminuted, and in this case, this is an ideal case to be managed with an intramedullary nail that can be introduced, uh, possibly even with a closed technique uh, where we don't open the fracture site and uh, give him stability back. Also, as a, as a uh, polytrauma patient, he's going to need uh, his upper extremities healed up as quickly and as functionally as possible. Another good reason to operate on the clavicle in addition to the femur. So that's exactly what uh, Dr. Krieg did. He nailed this fracture with a flexible titanium nail. At six weeks, you can see evidence of fracture healing without any displacement. And at 12 weeks, uh, even more fracture callus and the fracture is beginning to become fuzzy. And then at six months, the kid's totally healed and has a fully functional left upper extremity. Question, Dr. Chairman. So if you can go back one slide. Um, so we just heard Dr. Warm talk about removing hardware. Um, this is a young kid. Uh, is there any threat of leaving this hardware in or should this be taken out again? I would recommend taking it out. I think uh, the literature supports the removal of smooth devices from the shoulder girdle. And uh, it's fairly unlikely that this thing will move. It looks pretty well cemented in there at this point. Uh, however, I would recommend removal. To choose a proper device uh, that would provide adequate stability, uh, how do you do that? Um, how, which implants are, do you favor for intramedullary fixation, and how do you um, go to another if you're not satisfied with what you've achieved? I think it really starts as you're analyzing the fracture initially, and I'm more prone to utilizing an intramedullary device when it's not a comminuted situation. I think when you try to use an intramedullary device in a comminuted fracture, you're setting yourself up for problems, and I'd be very quick to use a plate 
in, in those cases because I think the, the fixation is just so much more robust and you can sleep better at night knowing the patient's going to do well. I, I totally agree. I actually meant specifically when you're using an intermedullary device, how do you decide which intermedullary device and of what size to use? Okay, so uh, when you're utilizing these flexible nails, for example, the younger the patient, obviously the smaller the intramedullary diameter, and so usually a child, you'll use a two millimeter uh, uh, device, and uh, even adult females, 2.5 is probably as big as you can get, and a, a large adult male, 3.0 is usually as big as you can get, so these, these devices are not particularly big. I would use the, the biggest one that I can get into the canal to get as much strength as possible. And uh, as Brett showed earlier, the anatomy distally, there's really not the greatest intermedullary canal. And you're essentially forming one for patients in some cases, and that doesn't really allow for a large device to get in there. Thanks. So, yeah. Dr. Hanel. Looking at this, and my, my first impression is that we don't have enough lateral fixation with this. How far do you have to go laterally? How do you know what your endpoint is, and can you distract your fracture with these devices? All common problems that are associated with intermedullary devices. So in, in this case, how did you figure out how far to put this laterally? I think that's a good question, and I don't know of any literature that clearly delineates how far you should get it across. I would say you'd like to get it across at least four or five centimeters uh, to get some amount of fixation uh, on the lateral aspect, but I don't know of any particular guidance in the literature uh, in that regard. So this is related to the last two questions. So you don't really get rigid fixation with this, and particularly you don't have any uh, rotational stability. So I'm wondering, do you change your post-operative protocol at all when you use these with uh, comparison to a plate? Do you restrict their motion any longer or keep them in a sling any longer? Typically, you're getting interdigitation of the fracture fragments with these, and in my experience, these have required open reduction through a small incision, so we actually... Uh, I haven't been able to get closed reductions on many cases, and I don't think it's a big deal to make a small incision. Then you can make sure that the rotation is actually perfect. There's interdigitation between the fracture fragments, and that gives you some amount of stability for rotational uh, control and motion. So uh, in most of the cases that I choose to use an intermedullary device, I can move the patient's active assisted forward elevation uh, right away. Next case is courtesy of Dr. Daphne Beingessner. Uh, I'll present this to Dr. Bernerska. This was a 37-year-old male that presented after a bicycle crash. He was a veterinarian. He was uh, right-hand dominant, and this was his only injury. How would you approach this clinical scenario? Well, this really heralds back to the, the last case where you could envision getting uh, cortical interdigitation of the fracture fragments, that's not possible in this particular injury because there's segmental comminution in, in the intercalary segment. So the fixation that you are going to employ will have to bridge the comminuted segment. And you can see on the, uh, this intercalary zone, this fracture segmental injury here will require reestablishment to the near and far fragments. And to get this to be stably fixed, that requires loading that once it, it's connected. So whatever plate you're going to use may well require uh, a multiplanar approach, uh, ideally with the minimal amount of stripping. Obviously, this is a significantly displaced injury, so it will require um, a longer implant and uh, potentially a little bit stiffer implant, but it all depends on what you get in terms of the intrinsic stability intraoperatively. This is a, a reconstruction plate, so one of these heat annealed plates, so it, it's contourable for the front. But uh, you can also see that the intercalary zone has a series of smaller lag screws. Many of these can be placed under the plate that itself so that you can essentially reestablish a single bone, but then you actually bridge the fixation with the reconstruction plate and essentially allow, um, as you can see, a relatively long implant to control the entire aspect of the shoulder girdle. And that's what you really need to have in these injuries. If you have a very segmentally comminuted with um, bone loss, the reconstruction plate may be the one venue where you would want to consider a DCP, but most of these will be uh, accessible and treatable with a reconstruction plate. Um, in this case, this was done from the front.
Let me ask a question again about hardware removal, so I'll perseverate on that. Winston uh, talked about removing a lot of the uh, IM nails because of a worry about hardware migration. How often in clinical reality do you have to take out plates because they're still prominent in the subcutaneous bone, Steve? That's a really good question, Jens, because the problem is that uh, there's been this move to treat these all uh, from the front because of the, once again, the plates being designed that to be allowed to be used that way, and the, the age old, you can't put them on the top because of a backpack. That's true in certain parts of the shoulder, but I would say in our institution, very few of these are removed, and then when they are removed, you have to remember that you saw the surgical approach for all the nerves. When you're then going back through the scar to remove an implant that's prominent, it becomes potentially at risk for injuring those nerves if they haven't been injured in the index procedure or by the uh, initial trauma. So in general, we try to think about putting these implants in and not removing them and having them be as precisely contoured as possible to minimize their, their uh, tendency to be prominent. So this went on to primary bone healing and the patient had an excellent result. This next case is for Dr. Warm. Uh, it's a 26-year-old male who presented to him with this displaced fracture after a fall on a snowboard. He's a pretty active young guy and likes to lift weights. And this is his dominant extremity. So in this gentleman, we talked about uh, operative fixation versus non-operative fixation. He was very interested in getting back to full function as quickly as possible. And uh, our plan was to use an intermedullary device, uh, which is what we did. You can see the medial starting point on the upper left. And uh, we were unable to get a closed reduction. I think doing these, you should try one or two times to get a closed reduction utilizing a, a uh, towel clamp <coughs> laterally or positioning the arm. We usually drape the arm free so that we can pull a little bit on the shoulder girdle. However, due to the fact that brachial plexus injuries have been reported, we're not overzealous in our attempts to do closed reductions and we'll make a small open reduction whenever needed. That's what we did in this case and we were able to get a good five or six centimeters of the three millimeter nail across the fracture site. So he really felt very good right after surgery. The fracture had nice interdigitation at the time of surgery. You can still see uh, a small gap there and some callus formation since this is secondary bone healing. But he was relatively asymptomatic uh, immediately after surgery. And uh, one of the hardest things I have is slowing these patients down and asking them to t give the bone time to heal. By the time we saw him at 12 weeks, he'd already found his way back into the gym, was benching over 135 pounds, was doing sets of 50 push-ups, and uh, although you can still see uh, what appears to be a fracture line, he's clinically united and asymptomatic. Uh, Mike? Yeah, I'd like to ask a question to the panel. Uh, if you go back to the initial fracture x-ray, if this were your fracture, Winston or Steve or Brett, how would you choose to have this treated? You know, we're all not 26-year-old male, so I guess I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on that. Um, do we really need to have 100% sh uh, shoulder abduction, 100% strength? I can see if you're a pitcher throwing a 95-mile-per-hour mile, mile fastball, it's more relevant. But at what point do you say non-operative treatment is adequate for this kind of patient, and what kind of patient is that? So I would say in a young patient with uh, uh, high demands on their upper extremity, and the fracture is displaced, I would recommend uh, fixation. If it was me personally, I would like to have my fracture plated. Uh, but yeah, I think the, what, what Steve's pointed out very nicely and, and Brett in the earlier reviews is this fracture with this amount of displacement is very prone to a non-union, which is going to have the person really laid up for a long period of time if they wait around for this to become a non-union six months later, you're still dealing with the same deformity and uh, weakness in the shoulder girdle and lack of ability to return to even daily functions. Uh, so I think you have to look at each person and each clavicle fracture individually and uh, talk to the patient and find out what they really want. And uh, patients that end up with non-unions are very often unhappy. And uh, even if they're not competitive athletes, I don't talk anyone into surgery, but I certainly give them the option of surgery. And I think you can use an intermediary device in certain instances 
where you have intrinsic fracture stability based on the lack of comminution. Steve, any thoughts? I think the main thing, the take home message is that classically, these are treated conservatively. We've become more aggressive in managing them by a number of means. Probably like many other bones that we used to think could be treated conservatively, the tibia is a good example. We almost always are treating tibia fractures operatively now because of the late sequelae to the ankle joint or the knee joint. Uh, I treated all the tibia fractures when I was in training conservatively, never operated on one that was acutely uh, injured. Whereas now we're much more aggressive in the management of these injuries because we're worried about the ultimate function 20, 30 years later. In the shoulder girdle, it's really no different. The, the major issue is in a widely displaced fracture like this, I would think looking at this initial displacement, once again, that superior view kind of illustrates a shortening as well, that you would be considering some sort of fixation for this rather than conservative treatment because of the foreshortening of the shoulder girdle. And you can really ascertain that by looking at the frontal plane of the patient and how the shoulder is foreshortened. Um, and they are immediately more comfortable. The real question is, whatever you're choosing for your fixation construct needs to be stable enough or else you have to tailor the rehab protocol afterwards for the optimal recovery. Because if you're too aggressive in a, in a fracture that's not accurately or well fixed, it will lead to a failure of fixation or instability, whether using intermedulate or plate fixation. So by a show of hands, who would want their clavicle, if this is your fracture, treated non-operatively? Let the record reflect about uh, five or six. Who would want, I mean, this nail fixation was absolutely beautiful. Who would want a nail put in? Same number. And who would go for a plate? A slight majority. So we have a split in the audience also. <clears throat> Very interesting. Uh, Corey? Uh, so I have two questions. Once the decision is made for open erection internal fixation, could you dis, uh, discuss briefly the supine versus dinner chair versus beach chair, which was mentioned earlier in the talk, pros and cons of those positions, and also management of the supraclavicular nerves, uh, somewhat tenuous, and those nerves are often right in the plane of dissection. And I was curious if you have had problems post-operative dysesthesias or neuromas uh, when those nerves are not actually sacrificed at the time of surgery. I think the big question, and you brought it out, is that good physical exam is very important. Many of these patients uh, will actually have avulsion of some of these nerves with a significant displacement uh, in the higher energy injuries, either from the direct blow or the, uh, the initial fracture displacement. So when you're doing the dissection for the surgical intervention, you'll actually not find some of these nerves in the process of your dissection because they may have well been avulsed. And these patients will end up with inclavicular, infraclavicular numbness. And if you essentially go through this with a bovi and essentially take these down, they'll have a, quite a significant anesthetic area of the front of their shoulder. That may be a problem with respect to other types of activities afterwards. Uh, it doesn't necessarily affect the plexus. It's uh, primarily these uh, cutaneous nerves that you have to be careful of looking at. We've, we've advocated doing more supine approaches largely because the radiographic evaluation is more uh, reliable. You can get intraoperative corroboration using a C-arm, which is very difficult to do with the beach chair position. Also, the weight of the arm is now negated, so you don't have the gravity effect of the arm, so that you can actually manipulate the fragment more precisely and perhaps have less traction on the, on the plexus doing it. Uh, I always draw the incision out, if I'm doing anything, to know where I would have to go in the bailout situation. So I would, if I'm going to do operative treatment, and I'm thinking of a smaller incision with an intermediary device, I would make the incision where I would ultimately be able to extend it so I don't burn a bridge for a late, let's say it doesn't work the way I want it to. And that's really, I think you, that sort of goes on this preoperative planning idea. You don't go in with just a plate or just a nail. You go in with the opportunity to do whatever is necessary in the indication for the procedure. Okay, I think we have time for one more case. This was actually a case from this past weekend at Harborview. Dr. Uh, Bernerska was on call. It was a 24-year-old male who crashed his motorcycle into a tree. The impact was directly over his clavicle. He had a complete brachial plexopathy, uh, but no apparent vascular injury. This, this really illustrates the high energy nature of some of the injuries we're now seeing. This injury, uh, the patient was um, required conscious sedation uh, with intravenous uh, uh, medication just to keep him quiet in bed, even though he had a completely anesthetic arm. He was very uncomfortable. And, on the ward, uh, the, the patients basically needed a continuous IV sedation. Uh, he was taking the operating room for management of this, and you can sort of see the high energy nature of this. It almost came out the skin with the initial displacement, so you can imagine the kinetic energy that was dissipated in this shoulder. Uh, this just shows you the, uh, 
approach that we made, and uh, I think there's a couple of the slides kind of show these nerves. Uh, this is just uh, the deep dissection. Here you see one of those nerves. It's right in the area where the fracture was reduced. You see we have a clamp across the fracture to interdigitate it. And then, as you can imagine, wherever you put the clamp is always where the lag screw needs to be. And unfortunately, that is exactly where the plate needs to be. So you have to work around that scenario. But what we many times will do is reduce the fracture, then contour the plate morphology, get it to be appropriately positioned on either side. And much like any other plate fixation, when we apply it, you are working through the windows that are provided to you by the, the dissection. And um, ideally, try to load the fracture so that you essentially have interdigitation of the fracture site. And then with the various implants, you can provide, uh, as you see, the oval nature of the holes allows you to get compression. We try to make an axilla between the plate and the fracture fragment so that when you're finished, this is the last fixation, you've compressed the fracture as much as you can, and now we have a lag screw across through the, through the plate that anchors it from inferiorly. Uh, one of his supraclavicular nerves was obviously a vulse because we didn't see it, although we saw two of the three that you would routinely see. Uh, and then uh, we try to do as cosmetic a closure as you can. And this just shows you, um, I think a lot of the, the other importance is that you don't place the screws directly orthogonal to the plate, and you see that all these screws are placed in different orientations, largely to try to avert the loosening phenomenon. You want to get cortical interdigitation with the plate and the superior surface, so you want to get as much compression as you can to create a unit. And so the um, idea is that the patient's arm can be moved without trepidation. Dr. Dunbar? When you have these high energy injuries, you see that, and that's distracted. In addition to your general workup, you really, really got to focus on a vascular exam of that upper extremity. Uh, obviously, you said this patient was had an anesthetic upper extremity, mm -hmm. so that speaks to the high energy of this, and that the vessels may have also been inj injured. And you really, in addition to a pulse exam, you probably ought to do comparative ABIs or you know, AAIs, if you like, um, comparing to the other side to see what the pressure differential is, because we've seen this a number of times where you'll get a, 130 on one on the uninjured side and it'll be 35 and it needs a stent immediately. And that has to happen right away. It's not just a closed clavicle fracture anymore. That's an emergency. I think we're all out of time. Uh, I just want to say thanks to everyone. Thanks to Dr. B, Dr. Warm, Dr. Chapman, and see you next time.